Apologies, everyone. Sorry for the wait. Wait. Is that ready to go? Hopefully. Right. Okay. So, thank you very much, um, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Marianne Magatza. Um, thank you for your patience um, this afternoon um, for waiting for me to get the technology up and running. I'd like to thank the committee for inviting me today to present on the work that we've done around our um, e-cigarettes and in vitro assessments. Before I start, I need to be this conflict of interest statement declaring that the work that was funded by British American Tobacco Investments Limited and that myself and my co-workers are full-time employees at British American Tobacco uh, for the duration of this research and for what I'm presenting. So, at British American Tobacco and our R&D um, laboratories in Southampton in the UK, we have been developing in vitro models of a number of different disease pathways, predominantly focused on lung disease, so we're looking at chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, looking at lung cancer, and also cardiovascular disease models. We traditionally use uh, the 2D systems and also some of the 3D systems that Dr. Holger Bursing presented uh, just before me. Um, and we also look at using a number of assays that already have regulatory compliance and are validated um, across regulatory communities, but also some of these model systems that are fit for purpose. Today, um, what I'm going to show you is some of the challenges and um, difficulties around generating appropriate aerosols for, um, for generating um, these matrices, but also look at some of these in vitro responses, in particular comparing cigarette versus e-cigarettes um, across a number of different platforms and different endpoints. We're really trying to harness the capabilities and the concepts around tox testing in the 21st century that we heard presented earlier on today by really focusing on using human tissues and using cells from um, human um, sources. So generating the test article, what does this look like with respects to ENDS testing? So the first and the most easiest way to do testing in vitro is to look at the e-liquid matrix itself. So this can be easily poured onto an, um, a number of different um, in vitro systems, and this has been reported very um, heavily in the literature of late. But however, this really doesn't give you a physiological outcome, particularly not using these in vitro systems, but also using the liquid. So the way to do this is to generate appropriate aerosols for these different types of products. Traditionally, particulate matter has been generated by the industry to look at the particulate um, components of uh, tobacco products, and this could be easily and has been applied to ENDS products as well. And this allows um, the aerosols of the vapour to be passed and captured onto Cambridge filter pads. These filter pads then can be, um, have the particulate matter eluted off using a number of different solvents. In our case, we use dimethyl sulfoxide, DMSO. This allows us to produce a solution that can be easily added onto these in vitro cultures. Aqueous extracts can also be generated um, using um, these ENDS models to develop another type of aerosol. This actually allows us to capture some of the water-soluble vapour um, constituents found in the extracts. Again, this media is um, generated by passing aerosols through biological materials such as cell biologi biological um, medias and buffers such as PBS. You can use numbers of different impingers attached to various different smoke machines to generate this solution. Again, this solution can be easily applied to a number of in vitro systems quite easily. Again, undiluted or in its diluted form. And then finally, the most physio physiologically relevant um, application of these types of matrices is to develop these aerosols or vapours from these products. Traditionally, this has been used by using a number of different um, smoking engine systems that are very complex and convoluted. And again, we can take air, um, the in vitro cultures and apply them to air liquid interface like chambers as shown here. It's really important to ensure that the in vitro cultures are kept at the air liquid interface to ensure that they have the appropriate exposures to the aerosols that have been generated. Again, this is very complex and it's very costly but also at the same time it's more physiological re physiologically relevant. Something to consider, and we've heard about this quite a lot this afternoon, is the in vitro dosimetry aspects. So what is it that the cells are actually being um, delivered, and what's actually being delivered to the cells, and what the cells are actually being um, in contact with within their cellular environment in the test system? I mean, it seems like a really simple concept, but actually to apply some of these chemical analytical techniques in an in vitro scenario is very difficult because you're working with such smaller test materials and agents. Across the different matrices that we're generating, there's a number of different types of methodologies that can be used um, to look at different types of chemical constituents. And again, across these different matrices, they're all represented in a number of different formats. So this could be micrograms per mils, it can be per puffs, it can be percentage volumes, it could be mils per minute. There's numbers of different ways. We believe using a cross-category marker such as nicotine really helps to anchor 
and as a common denominator, look at all the biological responses across all these different test matrices and also across all the different products. So I'm going to give you a few examples now of some of the endpoints and some of the test systems that we're using in the laboratory. And so that we're all on the same page, these are the products that I'm going to be showing and, and what we have tested in these assay systems. So we have used a conventional reference product, uh, 3R4F, um, and we have standardized and generated this aerosol using the Health Canada Intense Regime. We've also compared this with our Vipe e-pen um, e-cigarette product. And again, as we heard um, earlier on this afternoon, used a specific aerosol generation regime to ensure that we have standardization across the delivery. So this table nicely outlines the various different endpoints that I'm going to present to you today across the 2D and 3D systems that we work with in-house and also across the different matrices that we generate within the laboratory. And it spans some of these up-and-coming novel, uh, highly innovative um, um, in vitro test systems such as high content screening, but it also looks at some of the classical and really targeted endpoints around in vitro disease um, um, understanding and mechanistic pathways. And we also touch on some of the systems biology processes that we're working with within the laboratory to start having a global and a more holistic overview of some of the biological responses. So we believe that high content screening has a real place for screening um, e-liquids so that we know there's over you know, eight plus thousands of different types of e-liquids that are currently being sold and manufactured and available for use by consumers. High content screening offers the ability to really turn around quite rapidly uh, a very high level screen to look at these different types of systems. It's been used predominantly within the pharmaceutical industry for early drug discovery, but also within the chemical industry to look at toxicities of thousands of different chemicals as part of the EPA's Toxcast program. It's a roboticized, high-content screening approach using multi-well well, um, dishes. We can look at a number of different endpoints, so it's highly parametric. At the moment, um, the maximum number of endpoints you can look at simultaneously is about 14. And this uses a lot of uh, fluorescent um, dyes to look at specific targeted endpoints. So again, for us, this is a, a, an early journey for us to truly, really try and understand the dynamic range of this platform and whether we can use it across a number of different e-liquid formulations. And again, to really try to understand the key markers that we need to be assessing using these types of platforms. So classical regulatory toxicology, this really infers to the internationally regulatory um, uh, gene tox standard assays that are available out there for the industry to, to uh, test and assess the mutagenic potential of their products. So we follow the OECD test guideline 471, in particular the bacterial reverse mutation test, also known as the AIMS test. And this is an example of some of the results that we see when we put our e-cigarette and our tobacco products through this, this methodology. On the left-hand side, you can see our responses with our particulate fraction. We see a nice traditional dose response from our reference products, our 3R4F, showing a mutagenic response. But with our e-cigarettes, we see clear flat lines. When we take this assay to the whole aerosol, so this is taking the agar to the air, agar interface, again, we can see a mutagenic response with our 3R4F across a dilution range of whole aerosols. What's very interesting to note with this particular assay, we start to see mutagenic responses from our 3R4F products around about 24 minutes. So this equates to approximately about 50 puffs from a cigarette. If we look at our e-cigarettes, we see no responses whatsoever, so no mutagenic activity whatsoever in this assay. We've taken this up to three hours at the highest concentration available in this exposure system, and we still see no responses. So with that in mind, we have um, looked at the product in extremis and started to have a look if we can really push our product and how far we can go before we start to see a response. In this particular experiment, again, this is an AIMS uh, mutagenicity test, we've taken the product up to 900 puffs and we still do not see a response from the whole aerosol. With cytotoxicity testing within our laboratories at Southampton, we focus on using the cell line from the human bronchial epithelial cells, or H292s. The graph on the left-hand side indicates the responses that we generally see in the laboratory when we expose these cells at the air-liquid interface to whole aerosols. And we tend to follow the Nutri-Red uptake cytotoxicity um, assay, which has been set, set out by ICFAM. 
What we can see from this particular study is that the cytotoxic shift in response to e-cigarette is very, very different to that of our 3R4F product. So it suggests that there's significantly less cytotoxicity being elicited by our, our e-pen or our e-cigarette. On the right-hand side, this is um, a, a commercially available 96-well plate format cytotox assay looking at the caspase enzymes 3 and 6 to give us an indication of apoptosis. And in this experiment, we have tested our aqueous extracts and again, we can see a clear cytotoxic dose response with our 3R4F compared to our e-cigarettes. Oxidative stress, as we know, can stimulate a number of the different disease responses associated um, with exposure to xenobiotics and toxicants. We've used a number of commercially available 96 well plate assays um, available to test again our H292 human bronchial epithelial cells in response to aqueous extracts generated from our 3R4F and also our e-cigarette. What's really, really obvious from the data that we're showing here today is that e-cigarettes really did not induce any oxidative stress compared to reference cigarettes. So in particular, we're looking at intracellular antioxidant levels such as depletion of glutathione. We're seeing increase in reactive oxygen species elicited by 3R4F, but not by our e-cigarette. And we can see an increased response in the antioxidant response element. With respect to our cancer models, there are a number of different endpoints that we focus on apart from the, the regulatory gene tox assays. So DNA damage is one such in the laboratory where we focus on using the Bs2Bs human lung epithelial cell. This cell line again is taken to the air liquid interface and again has, um, is exposed over an hour period to different dilutions of our whole smoke or of our, our e-pen aerosol. And we can clearly see with this particular assay where we're, look, we're focusing on the phosphorylation of gamma H2AX. Gamma H2AX becomes phosphorylated upon DNA damage. We can see there's a clear increase in the phosphorylation of this particular protein in response to cigarette smoke treatment. The BHAS cell transformation assay is currently uh, undergoing a test guideline by the OECD and we use this extensively to understand the promotion activity of our tobacco products. So again, we've used this to, to see if we can see any promotion activity with our e-cigarettes. And when we look at the particulate fractions in this particular assay, we can see clear promotion responses with our 3R4F and none with our e-cigarette product. So then we move on to our cardiovascular disease models. In particular, we're focusing on atherosclerosis and looking at um, the damage of endothelial cells. In this particular cell system, we are looking at human umb umbilical vein endothelial cells and their ability to migrate into an area of injury. In this model, we've taken a monolayer of endothelial cells and we've induced a mechanical scratch using a pipette, as can be seen on the right-hand side in the panel there. So where the clear space is, this is where the, the scratch has been induced or the area of injury. Using time-lapse photography over a period of 22 hours, we can actually observe how the cells migrate into this area of injury in the presence or absence of treatment. And hopefully, this is what we've been waiting for. Oh, that didn't work. Let's try again. Okay, and so over a period of 21 hours, um, looking at time lapse photography, so we take a picture every hour, we can monitor how these cells migrate into this area of injury. And it's very obvious from this animation that in the presence of e-cigarettes, we can really see there's no inhibition of migration. But in the presence of extracts from cigarette smoke, we can see that there's an inhibition. So moving on to the 3D models that Dr. Bursing um, presented earlier on. So in this particular study, we have used the power of the 3D model systems to, in particular, the EPI airway model systems from MATE to start to, uh, to understand the irritancy of the aerosol um, within our exposure chambers. In this particular assay, over a six hour period, we have exposed um, the epi airway tissues to a concentration of cigarette smoke and compare that to e-cigarette over, as I've said, over a six hour period. Using um, the basic cytotoxicity assay, in this case MTT, we can clearly see that there's a cytotoxic dose response observed upon treatment with cigarette smoke. However, with our e-cigarettes, we really don't see any responses to suggest there's a less, less or little um, irritancy with e-cigarettes. The beauty of these 3D tissue systems, as Holger pointed out, is that we can really start to look at the functionality of, of these tissues and start to see how these mimic what an in vivo scenario would look like. 
In this particular instance, we're looking at the, the cilia beat frequency that can be observed on the apical surfaces of these 3D cultures in response to treatment. And I think if we can get this to work, you can see that the, the difference between the treatments is very uh, paramount. With e-cigarette, the cilia beat frequency remains very similar to that of air exposed tissue systems, but with cigarette smoke, we can really see that the cilia beat frequency is impaired and really reduces. And then using systems biology approaches, it allows us to start to have a look at a holistic um, overview of the mechanisms associated with um, an out adverse outcome within the tissue system itself. In this particular system, um, we've actually looked at the mucil air tissue that's available from epithelix. And we've dosed these cells over an hour period, and we've actually considered the dose in this respect. So with 3R4F, we've ensured that our e-cigarette is matched for nicotine. And we've also done a second experiment where we've double dosed with um, e-cigarettes. So we've doubled the dose of nicotine. Again, harnessing the power of omics, we've looked at tr the transcriptomic or the RNA expression using RNA sequencing. Um, and we can clearly see that there's a different pattern of expression between treated and untreated cells in that there are a significant amount more genes being stimulated and upregulated in the presence of 3R4F. Using some of the gene enrichment analysis pathways that are available to us in lots of ontology sequencing, we can start to map some of these RNA sequencing data onto numbers of different pathways with a focus onto specific biological functions and disease processes. And this just gives you an example of some of the gene enrichment analysis that we can do. So this is a heat map particularly focused on DNA damage. And we can really start to see uh, a clustering of, of, of RNA and, and genes associated with DNA damage with response to 3R4F treatment compared to e-cigarettes. And then I'd really like to draw the attention of the panel to adverse outcome pathways. So this is um, a framework that's been used by numbers of different scientists to start to, to hang their data um, around a series of causal events that linked really that anchored from exposure to a particular toxicant and looking at a, a, a molecular initiating event such as DNA damage, for example, or protein oxidation. And it's anchored right to an adverse outcome pathway. And this can be at the level of the organ or it can be at the individual population. This allows the researcher actually to start to pull the data together that's been generated within the laboratory from an in vitro perspective, but also to have a look at some of the clinical data that has been generated to start to identify if there are gaps in any of the research and also to start to discern whether there are areas for, for biomarker development and validation. And as you can see, this is very nicely shows how we have overlapped some of the data that we've presented to you across the different pillars associated with AOPs. AOPs requires a lot of collaboration to enable you to build up this partic a particular data set because it looks at lots of different key events, as I mentioned, from exposure right through to an adverse outcome. So we've been working very closely with Philip Morris International to compare our data sets across a number of different disease endpoints to see if we can build such types of adverse outcome pathways. And we've been very successful in generating two that we have managed to upload to what the OECD now have is known as the Adverse Outcome Pathway Wiki Database. So this is a, a really large database which enables scientists to upload their data and using crowdsourcing approaches um, a, a allows the data to be validated. And so just finally, in summary, um, we believe that in vitro holds a promise as part of a scientific assessment for e-cigarettes. We have demonstrated from our data that I've shown to you today there's significant reductions in toxicity and biological activities compared to tobacco products and e-cigarette aerosols. But there are a lot of caveats that need to be taken into consideration when conducting these in vitro studies. Extrapolation is key and we've heard a lot about that this afternoon, um, particularly when you're looking at um, human requirements. And in vitro dosimetry is really, really key to help, to help solve some of these questions. The exposures need to be appropriate, as so does the, the matrix that's being exposed to the cell tissue systems. Validation and qualification, Dr. Bursting again touched on this. Sometimes, actually, it's just good enough for the models themselves to be fit for purpose, as opposed to going through a whole process of regulatory validation. There are a lot of new tools that are available now for the researcher to start to support screening of these products into the future, but also systems biology allows for these global assessments of of biological outcomes and not just looking at specific targeted analysis. So this really supports biomarker discovery in, the vitro and in vitro and also in the clinic. And again, AOPs are just really key to enable us to start to organize our data in a, in a risk assessment manner. 
So just thank you to the team back in Southampton, and thank you for listening. Patience.